So um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, fellow speakers and students. A very warm welcome to our very first Oxbridge Hong Kong Scholars Symposium here in Hong Kong. My name is Alex, and I'm currently, I'm currently the president of Oxford University Hong Kong Scholar Association. Our association aims to bring together postgraduates from Hong Kong, but also as an academics in our university. And our aim is to foster a platform for knowledge exchange within the community. But aside from role, my role in the association, I'm actually a PhD student in biochemistry, soon starting my second year. Before that, I was studying an undergraduate in biochemistry, and then I did a master's in biochemistry as well. So naturally, now I'm doing my PhD. But looking back in my days as an undergraduate student, it was indeed a little bit difficult for me to understand what life as a research student was like, and certainly the struggles along the journey of a PhD student. When I was about to finish my, um, my undergraduate studies, I wonder if it was actually worth it to pursue postgraduate degrees at all. I wasn't sure whether I had gone to the right field, or not to mention that there are so many areas of studies under my field, biochemistry. So therefore, as some of those who have decided to go down to this path, my committee members, both from Oxford University and Cambridge University, and I would like to share, would like to share our experience and act as myth busters. We found that in Hong Kong, there seem to be quite a lot of misunderstandings about postgraduate studies in general. And um, for example, the decision to pursue further studies is sometimes perceived as procrastination, to sort of delay your job hunting progress, or the reluctance to confront your reality. Some people also may think that academia is only the, is the only future for research students, but as we will find out today, this, uh, this is not actually the case. So these are the things that we consider as untrue. There's so much about graduate studies, and we want to get the message out, and we want all of you to know it about it. So by inviting research students who are now at various stages of their career or studies to speak today, we hope that we can answer some of the questions you have, you might have, or you will have about, undergrad, or about postgraduate studies. Some of them just began their studies not long ago. Some of them is about to finish their studies or recently graduated, and some of them are already have started the career. So we hope to give you a full picture about what a PhD student is like before and after the PhD journey. So we'll soon start our uh, program of the day with um, a few talks, and then followed by the first panel discussion, which is about um, the ups and downs during the journey of the PhD. And after the first panel session, there will be a coffee break with some light refreshments, sandwiches, and stuff. And when the symposium concludes, there's another drink session with wines and soft drinks, which is longer, an hour long, and also, uh, and both of these sessions are just right outside the hall at the foyer area. So if you'd like to chat with any of the speakers, please feel free to do so. And um, if you'd like to leave at any time during the event, please try to do it between the sessions so that to uh, minimize the disturbance to our speakers. So uh, we really hope that this event can encourage more of you to consider postgraduate studies. Maybe it is right for you, but maybe after today you find out it is not is also fine, but uh, our, 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 our aim is to get you guys know more about postgraduate studies, PhD, or masters. So without further ado, let's invite our first uh, student speaker, our guest speaker. Um, it is Dr. Anthony Jern. And um, so because um, there, there's a slight change into our schedule um, to the moment, so we'll leave our keynote speaker to a later time. So we'll start with Dr. Anthony Jern. So Dr. Anthony Jiang has a huge interest in immunology and it was inspired by his secondary school studies um, by the biology teachers. He studied biochemistry at Chinese University of Hong Kong and obtained his Bachelor of Science and Master of Philosophy in 2010 and 2012. So um, then he went on to Oxford to do a DPhil in Medi DPhil, Doctor of Philosophy in Medical Science and now he is graduated and he will speak to you more about his um, career path 
in general. So, please. So thank you, Alex and his committee for inviting me to uh, give a talk of, on my DVU journey. So uh, Alex told me that the audience will be uh, uh, future PhD students, so who will be deciding to whether to do a PhD or not. So I decided to take this opportunity to make this more tailor-made to, to you, because I will talk, I will downplay my PhD journey a little bit and talk. I hope this talk will be more related to you. So PhD, a dream theater. A dream theater is actually, uh, I borrowed this title from uh, my favorite band, but you know PhD is a place where you can chase your dream, and it's a theater where you can do your best and shine on the stage. But let me start with a big question. So what is a PhD? So have you have uh, had a PhD in mind? So when you first decide to do your PhD, you ask your parents about any suggestions, and parents would have doubts, why are you doing a PhD? Why aren't you going to work? And then you, when you start a PhD, your workload power higher and your work goes deeper. And then you constantly pounding your head and generating ideas and then you get permanent head damage and your bo body start to fail and you can uh, proudly announce you are half dead. And then at last you're patiently hoping for a degree and you wait and you wait and finally you are a doctor of philosophy. Congratulations. But is that it? This is the PhD. So let me illustrate the PhD uh, journey with this illustration. Some of you have seen this before. So imagine the whole world, knowledge, is this circle. And when you start your primary education, you know you have applied this knowledge in the center, just a small circle. And then high school, you know a bit more. And then your college education, you know more and you have specialized a little bit more. And then you decide to do further studies, you know deeper and deeper until you reach the boundary of human knowledge. And see, this is where you are doing your PhD. And you are trying to push hard, harder and harder to expand the boundary of human knowledge. And then one day, it gives way. So you've got this tip, this is your PhD. So to you, this PhD is just a big picture, a, 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 it's a big piece of your life moment, but to the whole world, it might be small. But imagine if every one of you is doing a PhD and everyone trying to expand the human knowledge by a bit. So this is how our human knowledge runs. So everyone doing this part and then you expand the human knowledge. And this is why we are doing PhD. And during a PhD, you will read past and re recent reference materials and you identify the problems and you want to solve it. And you define the questions because you can't answer all the questions. You have to define your questions and you formulate a hypothesis and you try to make a prediction of what it will going to be. And you, tr you try to plan your experiments and you, the methods are important and you try to conduct them carefully. And you analyze your results and you try to formul form formulate your report and report to the a thesis committee, but is that it? Not yet, this is just the academic research. You need to discuss your data with your supervisor and your group members, because you are only leading a project, one project, but your group members know more than, than you do, and also your supervisor, he gives you a guide, great guidance. And then, if you're lucky enough, you can submit academic uh, research publications during your PhD or after, and at the same time, you also have to attend lectures, seminars, conferences, locally or internationally. And, then, and where you can present and discuss your data publicly, and this is important in your academic research. And also, if you get a chance, you can share your PhD journey here as well. So, these I call engagement with academic, academia. Also, during your PhD, not just about study, not just about research work. You can also join sports club, interest club, student union, just like you did in your undergraduate. And also social events like Oxbridge drinks and events and even orientation camps, you can join them. You can do volunteer work uh, locally, internationally, and paid work or paid work to su support your living during your PhD. I did my paper, I, I did photography sessions. I, because I, I myself am a photographer, I did 
paid work to support my expenses during my PhD. And you can also explore new interests that you haven't had chance to explore uh, during your undergraduate or before. So you will have your school life as well, not just about research. And then after, so come back to reality, you are thinking about what's next up after your PhD. You look for postdoc opportunities, and then, or you seek jobs in the industry. So postdoc is not just the, the only choice after the PhD. You, you, you can search jobs in the industry. This is the, the trend. And even you can start your own company. So startups is a hit topic. So you can even start your own company if you have a PhD, great PhD idea and present to the, to the fund, funders. And if you, are find, if you find yourself too exhausted uh, by your PhD, uh, so you can even take a break and be ready for the next move. So you have to plan your career very well after a PhD, during your PhD and for your after career afterwards. And during your PhD, you can make new friends and meet your boyfriend and girlfriend. Even, I know many people will get married during your PhD and even have a baby. So this is your personal life during a PhD. See, PhD is not just about research. Don't underestimate this period. This is a period of your self-maturation from being a college student to real adult. So you, you will be going through a lot of things in your life and they are important. Not, so don't just stuck yourself in, in a room or a lab or a lecture hall or uh, doing your work in front of computers. Just go out and, and enjoy your PhD life and there will be more. And so I will talk about my DPhil journey. So uh, I gained a great interest in immunology. So in, what is immunology? Immunology is, if I put it in a sentence, uh, this is uh, how human body strives to uh, maintain good health and prevent diseases. So your body is constantly attacking by, uh, attacked by uh, germs, from outside, so if you got bacteria uh, infection, your body immune cells will try to kill the bacteria or the germs and get rid of any diseases. So uh, immunology is uh, a big topic in medicine. So uh, we study the immune system in our body. So we have the immune cells like white blood cells, uh, red blood cells, and antibodies, and different kinds of uh, uh, immune uh, mediators, and we have the we, we will study the immune system as a whole, it's like organs, how our body organs can play in the to to maintain our immunity, and we study also uh, also study infectious disease like flu, uh, dengue fever, and we also study immunodeficiency. That is, you uh, like HIV virus gives you. Uh, AIDS, so this is uh, immunodeficiency where you, you lost your immunity. But too much immunity uh, doesn't help because you might get uh, autoimmunity if, the, if too, much, if too uh, much immunity is going unchecked. And also, cancer is also a big topic in uh, immunology. We always try to find a way to deal with cancer, and there is a topic called immuno-oncology. Oncology means uh, the study of cancer, so immuno-oncology is a hot topic now, and uh, we try to use uh, immunology ways Im to uh, fight cancer. And transplantation is another area. So, you know, uh, the tissue typing, and uh, we study how we can match the tissues uh, uh, among individuals for the transplantation, and we study how we can avoid the graft rejections. And at the same time, we also use different methods to study immunology. We need to know how to diagnose uh, the different immune disease, so diagnostics. And we also want to understand, the, after understanding the immune system, we want to know the cure, how we can treat the disease or prevent them. So like vaccines, antibiotics, do they belong to treatment and prevention? So these are the, like a brief, I'll give you a brief idea of what immunology is. And so, so immunology seems uh, uh, a lot of topic in it. So students often find immunology very complex, like A leads to B, which prevents C and results in D. So it's very 
complex, you have to remember a lot of uh, pathways like biochemistry and medicines, like you have a lot of disease to study. So students find uh, confused in immunology. But I find, I found immunology is like the art of war. Because when you study how body uh, use different strategies to fight germs or cancers, you know it is a, it's an art more than science. But now I see immunology is like this animation. But yeah, this, this, this cartoon, it, although it's cartoon, but surprisingly it gives a quite accurate uh, scientific uh, explanation. But I will want to show you the, sorry, so I would like to show you how uh, immune cells really work. See, the immune cells can eat the bacteria and digest them. And even the white cells can chase the bacteria like the animations do. They are very smart and macrophage cells engulfing the bacteria again, clearing them up, and natural killer cells attacking a cancer. Natural killer cells are good, uh, excellent killer, especially to cancers. Again, natural killer cells. See, these are the red blood cells, the, the hollow circles. And the white cells are chasing bacteria. So we so these cells are particularly called neutrophils. So, so they they can detect where the bacteria are and chase them and kill and eat them, kill them. And cytotoxic T cell is also an excellent killer to cancers. The red granules are the what we call the uh, like the explosive. They try to contact with the cancer cells and deliver the like a deliver uh, explosives and the cancer cells will just blow up. So these are the real cells at work. So not less funnier than the animations. So, so how I did my diffuse. So imagine my diffuse process is like a car making process and the red car at the end is my diffuse. So I started in 2007, my bachelor. So I, I decided to do biochemistry because it has one lecture called basics and applied immunology and that's one lecture so I decided to do biochemistry. And 20, uh, 2009, I joined the Fame Lab. Uh, Hong Kong, this is a science communication competition and I won the first place. And, and so, I, so studying is, not, is one part of your uh, journey. So uh, being able to communicate your science or your, your knowledge to the public is a real, uh, uh, is a soft skill that you should acquire. And at 2010, I obtained my bachelor and I've got my first research publication at the time used, uh, for my final year project. And then I carry on to do my MPhil, uh, in the, also in CUHK. And I attend, started to attend uh, uh, conferences and give presentations uh, in Australia. And then I, during uh, 2011, I contact my DFU supervisor, Graham Ock. Professor Graham Ock is a dermatologist in Oxford. So I started to uh, acquire a great interest in uh, dermatology, skin immunology. So I want to, I want to spend my uh, PhD in studying immunology of the skin, especially some skin diseases like psoriasis or atopic dermatitis. So I know uh, Graham is a great expert in this area. So I sent him in the email and said, I'm interested in doing a research in your group. Uh, would you like, would you happy to take me in? And he said, yeah, you, you, you can apply for a PhD in, in my group. And then 
after I finished my MPhil in CHK, then I went to Oxford. And I, and I started my four year study in the John Radcliffe Hospital. And during my DPhil, I, apart from my research, I also uh, in, involved in different extracurricular activities. I also, I try to learn Tai Chi and I, uh, try, and I also uh, involved in the uh, photo photography society. And also I started the Oxford Hong Kong Scholars Association during the end of, during, yeah, at the end of my uh, DPhil. And then I graduated in 2016 and get my DPhil. So these are the good memories that I have. I can't include all the good memories here, but see, uh, Oxford gave me a great opportunity to enjoy uh, great, a top-notch research in uh, one of the best universities in the world. And I learned a lot of photography skills as well from my mentor, Nas, here, and I learned uh, totally different uh, te new techniques. I, apart from, but like before my DPhil, I only know digital photography, but during my DPhil, I learned darkroom photography as well, so I did a lot of film photography at that time. So I, I, I learned these new techniques, I explored new interests. And I, meet, I make a lot of friends, and also I miss the GNDs in Oxford, if you know what I mean, those Oxonians, right? And this is my family and my wife. So I get married after my DPhil. So, so doing a study is important, I know, but maintaining, maintaining your personal life is also important as well. Don't miss that. So this red card, remember, this is your DPhil. So, you, so, it, so now you get your PhD, but it's not an end. So there's a long road uh, in front. And for my case, I joined New Beta Innovation. And this is a local uh, biopharmaceutical company, and I did I'm doing uh, immunology research, and I uh, supervise a lab and do immunology research in this company. And this company uh, has a product uh, of uh, blood substitute. So we try to meet the unmet uh, needs of the shortage of blood supplies uh, in Hong Kong and uh, in the world. And I also uh, actively engage in different professional bodies like the uh, IBMS, the uh, Royal Society of Biology and different. So you, you can, after your, your, your PhD, you can join these uh, professional bodies to keep your uh, academic, to keep your connections. And then maybe next, uh, I, I might be move on to the, uh, further studies or further interests, who knows? So, so it's now your choice. So you, so I did my PhD, but you are going to decide to, to do your PhD. So uh, I know choices may be difficult, but I don't, but whatever choice you make, it, it will matter a lot. And I hope uh, today, uh, as a first speaker, I hope to introduce what a PhD will look like and what my, PH, what my PH, PhD was, and hope you have, uh, you can make a good decision after today's talk. And thank you. Um, so thanks, thanks, Dr. Joe. Thanks, Anthony. So, um, do we have any question from the audience who would like to find out more about um, Anthony and um, like anything you'd like to know? Anyone? Um, hi, uh, thank you for your talk. I'm Ruhi. I'm a year three undergraduate studying life sciences. Um, my question to you was, um, how exactly did you choose your um, topic for research? Because immunology is such a big topic and I'm quite sure that you had a lot of different areas of interest. So, uh, yes, it tr it's true that immunology is a big topic. So, I, so for several reasons, I First, I know that uh, I want to study skin diseases because, you know, like in Hong Kong, skin diseases like ectopic, eczema, ectopic dermatitis, psoriasis affects a lot of people, and I want to 
uh, through immunology, I want to understand why these skin diseases happen and is there, and what, try to find a cure. And so I applied to uh, Graham's, Graham's uh, team to study uh, psoriasis in this group. Someone else? Is there anyone? So um, maybe a question for me. Um, so so do you find it, um, do you find the environment change from Hong Kong to the UK quite uh, like quite shocking? Do you have cultural shocks or and then when you move back from academia in the UK back into the company in Hong Kong, do you find the switch difficult as well? Yeah, I. So there are two questions. So two switches. So switching from Hong Kong to UK, I find first the the pace of the research uh, f between Hong Kong and UK are different. So uh, I, I, I'm not sure about uh, uh, in di different universities in, in UK, but in Oxford, we the research are intense. And we have, we, uh, I need to present my data like every, uh, every week in, during a group meeting and then uh, departmental meeting and also the different student meet meetings. So you have a lot, I have a lot of chance to present my data and being criticized is not, a, it's not fun, but you will learn a lot from different uh, people's ideas. So this is, uh, this, this is the uh, one big difference that I find uh, between Hong Kong and UK. And I, when I come back, when I came back uh, from UK and I tried to work here and I work in a pharmaceutical company, so I still, maintain a uh, high level of uh, research work, but at, at the same time, I still, uh, I learn a lot of uh, business world. So, uh, so the switch is not uh, too drastic because I still, I'm still doing uh, research, but in the industry. So you may, I, I still find, uh, this second switch is uh, more comfortable than the first one, I guess. Oh yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, there's, um, there's a question from my phone. Yeah. Um, yeah, my question is, why did you decide to um, go into industry rather than pursuing an academic career? And what were the kind of choices involved um, for you? So, yeah, uh, I think during my third, fourth or fourth year, of my D view, I knew that I will go to industry for sure. So, for so I I, d I consider postdoc as an option, but I will want to explore the work in the industry. I I will find it more stimulating, and this is so I I I'm, I I'm, I was quite sure that I will go to industry than academic research, and I. And I'm happy I made this decision because I learned, I, w I think I will learn more from the industry than from the academic. But this is just my point of view. So, yeah. Okay. Uh, one last question from Brian. Uh, thank you, for your talk. Mm -hmm. um, uh, what is the, the, how much time do you spend on research when you were in PhD, like, say, on average per week, and how how does that compare to that in the industry? So, so I need to define your question a bit. What is research? Is it doing a lab is it research, research or literature research also research? So, if you say, uh, if you ask how much time I spend in the lab, nine to six, but how about the literature research at home? So, it will it will be a lot of hours. So, but but. So during your PhD, you can't uh, really define your, your, your time during your research because I, I was constantly doing my research even at home. So, but in the industry, uh, while well, the working hours are quite standard, so you, you still get nine, and se nine to six work, but after work, you don't, it, it's not necessary for you to, to do your work after uh, working hours, so it's up to you. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Um, I just want to ask, um, what's your biggest source of pressure during your PhD, and how do you cope with it? Uh, pressure. Pressure. Uh, yeah, yeah I, I want to talk about emotional pressure. Don't, uh, yeah, uh, I, I'm, 
like, I, w I would like to confess that my greatest pleasure will be from my wife, actually. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's, 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 uh, it's important. You have to address it. So you, you may have your boyfriend, girlfriend during your default, and at that time, we, are, we were doing a long distance relationship, and, but at the end, we, we, we encounter it and we get married at the end. So my, the greatest pressure comes from the relationship, I mean. So not, not, not from her particularly, but you know, maintain a relationship is uh, one of the big obst uh, yeah, difficulties in, in my deep field research. But yeah, it is, your, uh, it is a period of your self-maturation. You, you, apart from your research work, you have your personal life to deal with. So this is, your, this is a growing up process. So, but luckily I make it, yeah. <laughs>